Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, this is a special live edition of Enemies of the State, a podcast hosted by Solrad, the online literary magazine for comics. I am your host, Alex Hoffman, the publisher of Solrad. Rob, would you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Rob Clow, uh, acquisitions editor of Field Mouse and uh, contributor at large to Solrad. Yes, and Jules? I'm Jules Bakes. I'm a freelance critic and I'm a board member for Field Mouse as well. And we have our special guest today, Megan Kelso. Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Kelso. I'm a cartoonist. I have a new book out called Who Will Make the Pancakes? That seems very, um, that seems very demure of you, I will say, because I have to say that Megan is one of my favorite cartoonists. I can't tell you how excited I am about this new collection. It's a gorgeous book. Fanagraphics has done amazing work with it. Um, so, but before we jump into uh, before we jump into the the depth and the breadth of the new book, I wanted to at least talk a little bit about the recent reprints as well, right? We've got a new copies of Artichoke Tales. Is that right? They did a reprint of that. Is that right? Artichoke Tales is going to come out as a paperback in December. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. And, oh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, and it's a little bit different. Um, I got a lot of feedback over the years that because all the artichoke people have the same hair and basically wear the same outfits, it was difficult to tell um, the present scenes from the flashback scenes because there's a lot of history in the book. And so the reprint has all of the flashback scenes printed in a different Pantone color. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, there's like what I think of as like the deep history in the book that's sort of a mythological past. And the characters from those scenes, um, we put these kind of funny patterns on their clothes. And the idea was the way like when we look at old paintings or photographs and old timey clothes look a little bit ridiculous, like Revolutionary War era jackets with the giant buttons. Um, so we put these little patterns on their clothes to differentiate them from um, the present and the, and the historical past. So uh, yeah, it was kind of weird to get to like go in and change the book, but it was also really satisfying to get that chance. And how how old, when, when did you originally publish Artichoke Tales? Well, I started drawing it in 1999, mm -hmm. and I was putting it out each chapter as a mini comic. And I did three issues of it as a mini comic. So it was like 1999, 2000, 2001. And then I just decided to like, try and put my head down and just finish it. And so I didn't put any of the other chapters out as minis. And then the book itself, uh, I think it was 2010. I think it came out 2010. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Such a, and I think the, uh, the, the changes I think are going to be uh, helpful because I remember this being one of those things. I'm like, is this in the past? Is this in, you know, so I'm, I'm excited to see the new copy. Um, we, Robbie will have to tell me what is going on in this picture right here. Uh, Megan can tell you. Uh, yeah, Ma Megan, please. Yeah, so um, Seattle just got a major league hockey team. Um, called the Seattle Kraken. And um, Seattle has this fairgrounds from the Seattle World's Fair that happened in 1962. And there's an arena there, which you can see in this picture. And it's, um, it's a historical landmark. It was designated a historical landmark because the architect's an important Seattle architect. And they wanted to bring this hockey team to this arena and they had to renovate it in such a way that the the like the outline of the roof wasn't changed because it's a historical landmark. So they 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 dug a hole. They they gutted the entire arena and then dug a deeper hole to enlarge it. Wow. It was a crazy project. 
Anyway, they had an art, public art budget for it, and I wound up finding out about it, and um, one of the art sites was to do some sort of permanent panels with images that would be mounted on guardrails, and they had in mind, like, this would be appropriate for a cartoonist or an illustrator. And so I applied for it, and I really talked myself up as a local girl because I'd lived in Seattle my entire life, and I had actually graduated from high school in this arena. Wow. <laughs> and they gave me the job. And um, so it's, the, it's my drawings etched onto stainless steel panels. Each panel is 10 inches high and 4 feet wide, and there's 85 feet of them. So it's like a mural, essentially. It's amazing. And it's a portrait of the city. That's absolutely stunning. Amazing. There's 21 panels 21 that comprise panels. 85 feet. That's... Uh, I try to make it as big as possible. It, that's, that, t that's huge. To me, that's just... That's, a, that's stunning. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for talking a little bit about the past. I'd love to move forward a little bit to um, your new book, a collection of five stories called Who Will Make the Pancakes? And so as a, a comics critic, first and foremost, I think the I have a question um, before I even let my, my co-conspirators get in. Um, where did the title Who Will Make the Pancakes come from? Uh, I'm glad you asked me that. Um, <laughs> I heard somebody say it, sort of in desperation. <laughs> a parent, I think a mother, but I really can't remember who it was or under what circumstances. And I thought to myself, yes, that is the essential question. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, uh, the pancakes are a metaphor for nurturing and caretaking mm. and family making. Um, because I love pancakes and I made pancakes for my daughter probably every Saturday or Sunday morning for like the first 10 years of her life. Um, and I don't even know if she likes pancakes that much. <laughs> but they're a way uh, that I express my love and my wish to give her stability. Um, and so parenting and caretaking, caretaking in general is a big theme in this book, as it turns out. And it just, I had the title before I even finished any of it, really, except for Watergate Sioux, which was already finished. I just knew that was, that was like my rubric, basically. Wonderful. Well, I think bringing up Watergate Sioux lets us move right ahead to this, uh, to, to the first book, in, or first story in the collection. Um, I was really struck by the way you in this so in this story to to spoil it a little bit um it's an inner family kind of drama talking about um the birth of children the growth and disintegration of families um the the questioning of past and and how does past engage the present um and it's all really based around a um a daughter's um trying to kind of interrogate her mother about the situation in which she was born into, um, which basically uh, the mother kind of remembers everything kind of based on what was happening in the Watergate scandal at the time of, you know, conception, uh, even as, you know, all the way up to birth, everything is tied to a specific part of the Watergate scandal. Um, I think one of the things that struck me with this, uh, with this story is how um, I don't know how lived it feels. The the there's there's some there's in this story probably the whole collection and maybe a, this is a signature of your work. But how even though this is a fictional story, how intimate it it felt to me. Um, and I was wondering how you managed to create these really compelling. You know, this is not very long. It's only I think something like 
30, 24 pages. I was going to say, around 30 pages, 24 pages. How do you make these characters that feel so intimate with just that short amount of page space? Well, I, I'd wanted to do, I thought I, I would maybe someday do a graphic novel about Watergate. Um, I, I heard Ben Bradley on Fresh Air sometime in the 90s, and it, it, he was the editor of the Washington Post during the Watergate scandal. And the stuff he talked about kind of jogged my memory of like how my parents just talked about Watergate nonstop when I was around three and four years old. So those are ha very hazy memories. It's mm -hmm. not like I knew <laughs> what it was, but it was big in our family. And um, so hearing that Ben Bradley interview, I was like, oh, I'd love to do a comic where like it like where I actually learn, like I'll do research and actually finally learn what happened and, and that'll be part of it and then my family will be part of it. And uh, you know, I had a notebook and I would take notes and put stuff in there. This went on for years and then I had a baby, I was living in New York and my baby was like six months old and I got a call one day, literally I just got a call one day from the New York Times saying, do I want to do this serialized comic? It had been like, I think Chris Ware had been the first cartoonist, and then Jaime Hernandez did one, and I followed Seth. So it was a big deal. And I, yeah. did, I never even considered saying no, but I was just like, oh my god, how am I going to do this? And uh, so... I was just like, oh, the Watergate thing. It'll be perfect because I've already like thought about it a little bit and it's serious and the New York Times is serious. Um, but I was thinking graphic novel and, and now I'm thinking, uh, I mean, Chris Ware went on for so long. Mm -hmm. His, I don't know how many pages his was, but they were like, okay, after Chris Ware, it's 24 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no more of that building stories. <laughs> Rain it in. <laughs> yeah, reel, um, reel that in. So yeah. they were very strict. <laughs> so I was like, oh, whoa, how am I going to... I mean, I didn't have a story yet or anything, but, but I just had to like really scale back my ambitions. But I just was like, I'm going to pack as much as I possibly can into each week. Um, and so... But I didn't want to overwhelm people with lots of writing because I hate comics like that. So I was just like, details, you know? And um, I have the luck for, for doing a story like this of having lived in the same house for the first 18 years of my life. So I have this floor plan etched into my brain and I just, I just drew the house I grew up in um, and... I think that's what gives it the intimacy that you're mm -hmm. picking up on. Mm -hmm. it, even though it's you know different characters, it feels lived. I, you brought up that haziness of memory. I think that's really interesting because there's the older sister character um, who's having these kind of like trying to understand. She's young, trying to understand what's going on with Watergate, and it's like. The, the mailman's a crook. The mail, you know, the mailman is Richard Nixon. You know, like yeah. I, I thought that was a really clever touch. Well, I don't know about you guys, but uh, my childhood sense of things was filled with that kind of conflation. Like someone who was maybe a friend of my parents would look like a movie star, or have share features with a prominent figure, and I would kind of just think of them as that person. I don't know. It's like a visual shorthand, or, mm. um, but yeah, I had that. I literally had that with the mailman and Nixon. They both had that brow and were around the same age, and I just kind of thought of them as the same person. I mean, I know, like if someone pressed me on it, I I would admit that <laughs> 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 I knew the difference, but. Yeah, I did that all the time as a kid. It's, it's that childhood confabulation. Yeah. yeah. I had one of those. Big Bird was my grandma. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally makes sense Very to me. Very tall, same voice. Vibe. There's Don't just vibe. a vibe, <laughs> right? Absolutely the vibe. Yeah. Big Bird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know, and I think, and it's to a certain degree, that's a, this is, forgive me, the, the medical professor talking here. 
that's a that's a that is a uh, a function of the childhood brain uh, mm -hmm. because the the differentiation between what is real and not real. And um, that's the reason why small children have imaginary friends that disappear as they get older, yeah. um, because the what is imagined, what is real, the 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 connections in the brain are not as fully formed as they could be. So that's a that's a, a very common phenomenon. So that's also uh, a critical way kids begin to structure their permanent life view, which is interesting in the context of this story where it's you know all centered around like one of the biggest political scandals at the time. Mm-hmm. Although Buffalo up, right? Yeah. All right, let's see. Well, why don't we move on to the next story then? Um, I, so we go from this, we go from uh, a Watergate Sioux, which is this really, um, it's serious. It, you're, like, you, like you said, it's very serious in tone. It's, you know, it's dramatic. It's, there's, you know, this, there's these questions about life and death and birth and, and politics. And, and then we go, to a, we go to a story about a lady who has trained her cats to be butlers and nannies. And, and, and I wanted, there's, to me, there is such a jarring shift, not just because <laughs> the first story is full color and the style's a tiny bit different, and, but... Just tonally, I'm like, okay, wait, you know, I'm expecting a certain thing out of the book, and then we get to this next story. I'm like, oh no, this is a whole nother thing. I, you know, so it took it took me by surprise, and I was wondering how you decided to put, you know, what was when you ordered the stories in the book, like what was your what was your thought process there? Cats in Service happens to be the very next story that I made. Um, but then the last, the last three I worked on concurrently um, over the years. So it might have been that. Um, it might have been that. Just like uh, Cats in Service was a huge transitional work for me because... I, I put down artichoke tails to do Watergate Sioux because mm. it was a full time job. Yeah, yeah. And then we moved back to Seattle. This was in New York. We moved back to Seattle, and I was like, okay, I got to finish artichoke tails. And it, it was just the drudgery of comics at that point. It was like computer gray shading. All that jazz. I, I remember talking about it. And you said that the inking of that book nearly murdered you. And that towards the end, I, I didn't really feel like I drew that way anymore. So I was like having to like draw in a way to keep it consistent that I didn't even really like anymore. So, so Cats in Service, I started working on when my daughter went off to kindergarten. I finally had some more time because I was a stay at home mother. And I just was like, I want to draw differently. I don't want to do computer color. I don't want to do computer gray. Um, I want to go back to just black and white on the paper. And I was actually telling Gabrielle Bell, like, I look to her approach to light and shadow and spot black. Oh, And totally. I actually oh, just wow. full on copied Gabrielle for a while until I kind of figured out a way to that was me. That spot black on the yeah. chair. Yeah, the spot totally that's her. Gabrielle Bell. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Now, yep. now that you mention it, I was I was looking at that. I'm yep. like, when I was reading the book, I'm like, that looks so familiar, and yep. I'm not sure where it comes from. <laughs> and now that you said that, it's like, oh, duh. Okay, yes. I, exactly. I owe her so much. <laughs> um, so so this story was like, I just want to draw comics differently. Um. And so it just made sense because I feel like the rest of the book is like the house that that Cats in Service built, I guess is the best way I, to put it. That's a that's a beautiful um, a beautiful metaphor. And you know, it is the the Cats in Service is um, has a silly premise, right? Like that you've trained cats to be waiters, and and, and but it's actually not a silly story. It's kind it's, of a dark story. It's a very, yes. yeah, it gets very dark. I, I think having it situated right after Watergate Sioux is really interesting, actually, because um, the intimacy that Alex was talking about, 
that was within Watergate Zoo that's present here too, but you can start to see it become more something more like claustrophobia. Well, it takes place in the same house. Right. Like I mentioned yeah. that I lived in the same house for the first 18 years of my life, and uh, the house is not as important in Watergate Zoo. It just happens to be the setting, yeah. but the house is extremely important in Cats and Service. Yes, it really is. To the plot. And so it's the same house. So they also go together for that reason. <laughs> I hadn't really, I hadn't really uh, said that out loud before, but yeah, I didn't they go together, together in that sense. It, it felt, you know, even though it was, a, it, I think it, it comes through in the comic because you're looking at, you're like looking at these scenes and you're like, this feels familiar, even though it's n very different in terms of tone and structure and everything, it really felt very familiar mm -hmm. from one to the next. So mm -hmm. that was, it was a, uh, I guess a, a tie-in line that I felt in the comic, even though I didn't really like cognitively realize it was going on. Mm -hmm. Kind of a, uh, I, uh, I'll, uh, I'll brag on you a little bit. I think it's a masterful stroke because it, it, it keeps, it keeps the reader kind of engaged in the placeness of the work mm -hmm. um, that I think is, I think is a, a core tenet of what you're doing throughout this entire book. Um, in, in this book, and in your comics in general, even from the very beginning, there's um, there's always an ambiguity in your characters, and uh, there's never a narrative sense that you're judging anyone, and that there's like you allow each character an essential humanity, e even as almost all of them are flawed. Mm -hmm. And in this book, I think about your title, and I think about the way it ties everything together. It's a very the specific way, who will make the pancakes? Who's asking that question? Is, is like, is the caretaker asking the question? Is the child asking that question? And throughout this book, there's a very fraught relationship between specifically mothers and children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and on the one hand, there's a tremendous amount of sympathy for the children in the story that like, you know, in almost all the stories, in, in mothers and children in the fifth story between uh, the responsibility of adults and children who are not um, parents, and it's kind of like the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole different thing. But in this particular case, um, I, there is sympathy for the mothers in each of these stories because in their own ways, they're all chafing against this role they have in their lives that to the degree that they want, to the degree that sometimes they don't want, and to, to a degree they feel they're forced into. Um, and so you feel, and you feel, in each of them wants something different. And Watergate Sue, she's you know, it's like, you know, her husband's basically say, we're gonna have another kid. Mm -hmm. and that's just the way it mm. is. Um, I think you set that up nicely, Megan, by, um with the inclusion of those uh, Agnes Bluebird uh -huh. segments. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was really beautifully done. Oh, thanks. And it, not me, like, Googling Agnes Bluebird when she was first mentioned <laughs> to see what she looked like. And then realizing she <laughs> There's no <laughs> Agnes Bluebird. <laughs> I found that out. It's, it's such a clever, yeah, no. meta, it's such a clever me meta commentary. On it. And, like, she's even, like, you know, almost like the last strip is, like, it's like breaking the fourth wall. It's mm -hmm. like... I know you think I'm square, but you know. so Agnes Bluebird in the Watergate Sue story, there's these little comic strips that run above the main story, and one of them is this like domestic uh, tips, kind of like hints from Heloise. I don't even know if anybody knows what that is, but like she's a ho she's a traditional homemaker, and she's telling you like the best way to like polish silver or how to get sweat stains out of your husband's shirt. Like the kind of thing you'd read in a women's homemaker magazine from mid century, mid 20th century. So that's what we're talking about, Agnes. I, I love her very much. I, I learned how to <laughs> fold a fitted sheet from Agnes. So what? I learned how to fold a fitted sheet from yeah. Agnes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and sort of following it up, it's kind of interesting because in each story, the mother is doing something that is inadvertently traumatizing her children with because <laughs> in Watergate Sue like the whole talk about um, you know the the other daughter Josie is like is terrified that the burglars are going to come in through her window and mothers understand it 
And then there's the big breaking point where like her sister's like, yeah, you almost, you almost didn't exist. And it's sort of this breaking of, it's all, it's, it, it's funny because it's like this, it's all about these hearings, right? This interrogation. And Sue is interrogating her mother and her mother is like obfuscating and denying and like, I don't remember because she knows what the real, deep down, she knows what the real truth was even though she didn't want to talk about it. Sure. And in Cats in Service, um, the nanny, uh, it, it, the, the kind of indolence in this story where like people stop being responsible, not just for like dinner and things like that, but like you should stop taking responsibility, taking care of a child. Mm -hmm. It's like the nanny is raising a child, you know, in, in a very real way, and how in effect that was. And um, and the most obvious example of this is in Corinne Voss, where. Um, she's kind of, she wants this romantic fantasy and um, all the while is like disconnecting from, uh, from her children in a very obvious way. Mm -hmm. um, these are themes you've, even, even before you became a mother, were like dealing with like the effects, the, the thinking of children, the thinking of as a parent. How has this evolved for you as a cartoonist and a person um, you know, before your child was born, when your child was born, and as she's grown older. And to what degree has this been like an intentionality in forming these stories? And to what degree is this something that's always present in your thinking? Hmm. Um, well, I really thought for a long time I would never have a kid. And so, um, I, it was my sort of natural tendency before I had a kid to like think about these stories more from the kid perspective. Hmm. And while I think I was sympathetic to mother characters in my work at that point, there was a ignorance, I guess, for want hmm. of a better word. So then when I did have a kid and became a mother and a parent myself, um, it, it was, you know, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I also, I lost a connection to childhood. I think that's yeah. one of the hardest things about being a parent, especially if you're, I clung to childhood. I don't know about you guys, but I did not want to grow up. I clung to childhood, and once you become a parent, um, it's game over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're not a child anymore. Right. And uh, that uh, losing that w was kind of weirdly hard for me. Um, and I don't know if that's reflected in the stories, but I can't help but think it is there a little bit that my allegiance has shifted towards the parents. Mm. Not that I don't give the children their due, because I do think it's always important in my work, like if I can't, you know, if I can't give sympathy to, to all the characters in the book, then, the, then I have to get rid of that character. You know, like I, yeah. I, I found myself creating ciphers kind of early on and hating it and feeling really gross about those characters and just like, okay, if I can't give each one their due, then I got to figure out either how to, or I cut them out. Yeah. That's, that's a really interesting, like a creative choice, but I think it makes sense for the type of work that you do. I think, you know, I don't think these stories are going to be, would be nearly as impactful without that kind of uh, creative decision. I'll say to me at least. Well, I think this is a good opportunity to move on to our next story, which um, really striking in terms of its a change in style. And like we go from this uh, beautiful black and white, very, you know, Gabrielle Bell, as you say, inspired to something that at first glance, if you're not paying attention, feels almost like the illustrations for a, like a picture book, you know, um, gorgeous colors, like just a, a completely different um, window into your creative practice. And I wanted to understand 
um, what what you were thinking about or what was the what was the you know kind of decision to move and you know to have this variety of styles that you were working in because basically the last you say that the last three books of the or the last three stories of the book are kind of being done simultaneously but they all look very different um, so I kind of wanted to hear a little bit about that yeah uh, thanks for asking that so um, so I, I this book I made to accompany Watergate Sue. I was like, I'm gonna have a book of stories and and I know Watergate Sue's in there, so the other stories, you know, are gonna go along with it. Um, and then uh, the, the other stories all wound up being much longer than Watergate Sue, mm. and that was a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Cats in Service was the first one, and as I said, it was a way to get away from computer coloring because I was just sick of like doing art on the screen, and I wanted to get back to paper. And while I was doing um, while I was doing Cats in Service, I had this idea like, well, there's a lot of ways to do comics on paper and color printing. You know, over the the, the years of my career, the 30 years <laughs> of my career, has become so much cheaper. And also, I've noticed a lot of cartoonists now just draw their final art in pencil, which has seemed so radical to me. Like, that just wasn't, like, it wasn't what people did in the 80s and <laughs> 90s. And I, I just love that freedom to, like, do comics with whatever art material you want. So, so I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. I think I'm going to try all these different ways to work, make comics on paper, uh, and then maybe I'll know by the end of the book kind of how I want to proceed. So it was very, um, it was a very self-conscious thing. Like I wanted to try it all. And with watercolor, I don't know what I was thinking because I don't know how to do watercolor. I actually took a class, like an adult art class, um, in watercolor technique because. I needed some help. And, um, you know, I'd never even really studied painting. And what I learned in that class, which probably all of you know, is that in painting, you're working with creating edges with light and shadow, light and dark paint. Um, it's not about lines. Painting is not about lines. And I was just like, what? <laughs> and so then it felt like this really fun challenge to be like, can I make a comic with no lines? Like, oh! And so that was like the goal that I set for myself with the egg room. That when you say that I that you weren't uh, that you weren't a studied watercolorist or painter, uh, uh, I I almost wanted to say, well, that's clearly not the case because look at this image. Uh. Well, not all the panels are as good as this one. I think well. I picked one of my <laughs> best ones for you. Game system. How dare you? Uh, that is uh, that is uh, that is very humble. I I disagree, but we can move forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I learned, what I did learn, is that like having done art for almost thirty years before I took the watercolor class, I was a little ahead of the game, because I knew how to draw, I knew mm. how to like create images, and a lot of the people in the painting class, not only did they not know how to paint, they also didn't know how to draw. Mm. So like, turns out you can be kind of a quick study if you already have some art. Art under your belt. Yeah. Had you done like any study of color theory or color prior to this? I I I'm kind of self-taught. Like through doing computer coloring, mm -hmm. I learned a lot. Like Watergate Sue is like the first sort of fully colored comic I did, and I learned a lot. Um, so that also helped. Yeah. Egg Room is kind of a, a, I think of all the books and or all the comics in this book, I think is the one that I struggled with the most in terms of just trying to wrap my head around it. Um, I just felt, it just felt so expansive to me. It felt like it, it multiplies on itself. And by the time you get done with it, it's, um, I, I just felt, I hate to say it, overwhelmed. And I'm not a person that gets overwhelmed by comics um, because it has this kind of like multiplying tendency, I feel, um, that comes through in the comics. So I wanted to know like, what you were thinking about in terms of themes and, and what you're thinking about in terms of what your goals were for this comic, because it, 
that I, I just it just struck me as something that it really was a as a challenge for me as a reader, and not in a bad way. I, I it was a great challenge, but it also um, I'm not used to being flummoxed by comics, and this one flummoxed. it got me. It really did. Huh. I just want to say this one was my favorite. Huh. Yeah, it's really can you, good. Can, it's, can you be more specific? About I, what exactly flummoxed you? It just I as I'm reading it, I'm like, it felt like. I don't know if I want to say that it expanded my mind, but it was like there's like it feels like the stuff that's on the page is a microcosm of other stuff that's happening in the background. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. It felt like there I it almost looked like it almost felt like, I guess, that I was looking through a picture window and seeing dimly, if you will, Mm -hmm. something much greater. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I've not really ever had that experience with comics before until this piece. So I, does that help at all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe, okay. Jules, you can help me out. <laughs> I, I think if I was going to find a thread in this, and I do want to read it like 17 more times because it was fascinating, but um, I, I, I think it echoes sort of an element of Watergate Sioux where uh, there's a woman who is kind of constrained by a particular set of circumstances within her life, right? Like Watergate Sioux finds she is sort of defined by she, she exists within the parentheses of Watergate and almost found out that within those parentheses, she, her very existence was actually pretty tenuous. And then you've got the protagonist of the egg room who is, and correct me if I'm wrong after this because this is just what I saw, but the mm-hmm. protagonist of the egg room is um, she, like encountering her own set of constraints. Like what she's experiencing is just w- with the young man that she turns down, you know, with the film career that she doesn't um, achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, and then within her dreams, she, like, this is maybe reading into it too deeply, but the eggs themselves seem to perhaps be um, those constraints and things within her that were, yeah, I might be going off on, a, on an incorrect thing, but. Yeah, no, well, uh, you know, that's an interesting interpretation, and some of it, I, yeah. For, well, okay. For, so here's my angle. Uh, uh-huh. It's an interesting story. They have this the third story. It's the center. Uh-huh. It's the middle. Ooh, I didn't really. It, it's okay. commenting on everything around it in different mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. And again, I when I read stories and I think of stories, I, I, I think of them in terms of structure. And structure, I think of it as always, what does the protagonist want? Um, and this is the most interesting one to me because um, in, in Watergate Sue, there's a, there's a sense of like, well, she's not exactly sure what she wants. She's reacting against things. But um, in the egg room, she's, this is like the most passionate and directed person mm-hmm. in, in the book. She's got like this, um, this fire. She has this... Um, like uh, this mix of like intellectual, intellectual and sexual heat simultaneously, mm-hmm. and they're the same thing. They're mm-hmm. all tied together, mm-hmm. and she's like, and it's for her, it's like I am going to express this. And Rob, let me inter- interrupt you just for a second to say that the this is the time that Windows decided it would be great to do some updates. So, uh, oh. so we've <laughs> lost AV. Uh, it, Working on the updates, we're at 30%, so we may get video back in time for the, well, <laughs> the rest of the panel, but we may not. I'll keep yammering for a second. All right, all right, but uh, this, is not an, this is not anything that our AV crew has done wrong. Uh, yeah. This computer has decided that it, it, is, it is done doing what it wants to do, and it's going to do its own thing now. All right, well, hopefully it'll come back soon. <laughs> but yeah, so like I, I see this, like, and, and, and again, because if you go to the next one with Kryn Voss, it's like, she also has these desires, but they're so they're, they're so much more flighty and not rooted in reality. And, and this this character is so simultaneously earthy, and that these dream sequences show that like you know her, her flight she had these flights of imagination elsewhere as well. Um, and uh, you know you talked about like this is the book where it's like you're starting to you, you switch sides. Now, <laughs> yeah, right. Now you're the adult. Yeah. Now you're the mom. <laughs> um, how, how are you, like, you it's, know, uh, it, I, I, it's I'm, just I'm not going to, 
I never push anything on kind of on the author, but like in exploring these different ideas <laughs> of like Prunavas is fantasy. It's the computer. Yeah. But um, in the egg room, it's like this real sense of like she's an artist, and she's and she and she has this desire. Um, and versus cats in service, where it's like this, it, that's almost a sense of withdrawal from responsibility and reality. She's the most engaged character. Hmm. Um, in, in thinking about each of them as like their own persons, um, how, how do, your, do your characters like come up with like live, lives of their own? Do you feel, or this is something that like you're very guided by like things you're thinking, feeling, seeing, seeing yourself or and or other people? Um, so when I talked about like doing Cats in Service was my first story after Artichoke Tales um, and wanting to draw differently, I also just wanted to make comics differently. Like um, when I first started doing comics, I would write the story and then I would adapt the story into a comic because I grew up writing and drawing, but I was a more comfortable writer. And then Artichoke Tales, I kind of, I kind of moved away from that, but I still, in the, especially the early chapters, I sort of scripted and they were pretty planned. And then like as I was closing in on the end, I did a lot of planning and I, I really wanted to, to um, draw comics in a way where, where the ideas were more generated from the drawing. Like I, I could feel myself moving in that direction anyway, mm. and I just felt like it elicited more interesting work. And I, I learned mm. a lot from Linda Berry, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from other cartoonists who I knew worked sort of more intuitively and more sort of starting with the drawing. So that was, it wasn't just like, oh, I wanna work on paper. It was like, also I want to work more from an image that begins a little more mysteriously and not be so kind of programmatic about how I make stories. So uh, the egg room, so a lot of stories over the years that I've done, the, 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 the initial kernel of idea was from a dream and then I build on that to like make it into a story and um, the egg room is, is falls into that category. So the, so the dream of the like plentiful, beautiful eggs was my dream. And then I built the story around that. And that's partly why I wanted to do it in watercolor because I wanted, I felt like watercolor was a good way to express that vivid, dreamy stuff I see at night. Because <laughs> I dream very much in color a lot. And, and then the story became an exploration of like the different kinds of dreams we have. Um, so I was always in that story pretty consciously trying to kind of move in a pretty intuitive direction. And uh, Tim, who's in the audience, read an early draft of this story and helped me get, uh, get a little more clarity because like <laughs> it, it was in the mists <laughs> for a long time. Um, so I did a, I don't know, I don't know. Now I feel like I'm just rambling. Um, but that's the best way I can describe well, like sort of the process of making that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that sounds, yeah, it was like, the, you know, it sounds like the connections that are created these, between these stories, what you're saying, they're intuitive connections. Yeah, and I mean, also, when I think of, when I think of the main character in the egg room, like, she didn't, get married, she didn't have children, she pursued her career, so like if she were to like go out for coffee with the woman in Watergate Sue, you know, the mother Eve in Watergate Sue, she'd be like, wow, you did what I sort of wanted to do or secretly hoped or, you know, that kind of thing. And yet, like, we all have constraints, you know, mm -hmm. like we may look at someone else's life and think, oh, I wish I, I was as free and unconstrained as that person, but th that 
person is not feeling probably <laughs> free and unconstrained. So I think maybe even though I wasn't super conscious of this, I was exploring uh, different forms of constraint, you know, in, different, in the different stories. I wanted to... <clears throat> I, I, something that Rob said struck me about the main character um, in in this third story about saying that I, help me remember if I this is misquoted, but essentially that this that the main character is probably the most vivacious or alive or um, and to me I felt like actually I felt that way about all of the characters in the final story, Golden mm -hmm. Lasso. Um, and it, these these young women who have this very unique hobby and what they're, like, out doing in the world. And to kind of, as we reach kind of the close of the, of the panel, I wanted to talk a little bit about that final story. It looks like I have a computer now, but I don't under, I don't know what the pin is. So if someone from AV could help, we'll get the slide deck back up. <laughs> <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about Golden Lasso and 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 that that story? Yeah. So uh, uh, right after I moved to Seattle, I was kind of a big deal because I'd done Watergate Sue in the New York Times. So I had this like brief moment where uh, people were inviting me to do cool things. It didn't last very long, but it was very nice. It was very <laughs> nice. And I got involved in this project where New Orleans and Seattle artists were asked to create a, a, a new thing for a live performance. So I wrote a 10-page story and I delivered it as a slideshow. And it was called The Golden Lasso. And it was basically this story, but when I finished it, I had this horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach that it was all just a lie. It was mm. a very dishonest story, and it, it kind of ate at me, and I didn't like it. And I really had never experienced that with something I'd done, or not to that level. And so... It, this story took me a really long time to do. I did many different drafts. There were many like dead ends because it's a, it's a fairly straightforwardly autobiographical story and I don't work that way normally. I don't, in, in almost all of my work, I feel no debt to the truth. I feel only interested in like, making the story work and being true to my idea. But for this story, I realized if I was gonna tell it, I couldn't, I couldn't work that way that I had in the past where like, I don't care what really happened, you know, I'm just making a cool story. It, it felt so dishonest and just wrong. So I redid it and it was really hard because I'm not an experienced autobiographical cartoonist. And um, that turns out to be a lot harder than you might think. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, what else do you want to know about it? <laughs> uh, um, well, we're just, we're working on getting the slides back up. So give me a second. Rob, can I, can I lean on you for support or Jules? Can I, I actually, uh, yeah, ahead, Jules. I wanted to talk a little about Corinne Voss. I, I have a lot of questions about it, but I, I guess my most pressing one is about it. So that's the story where the pancakes actually come in. We talk about pancakes. There are actual pancakes actual. Yes. in that story. <laughs> and I was really struck by the story you quoted that, um, Corinne is reading to her kids. Um, oh. The Long Winter. It was The Long Winter by Laura Ingalls Wilder, part of the Little House series. Yeah. And I just thought it was really interesting that she's reading from this book. Um, it, it, in earlier, you were talking about how pancakes to you represent like nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. And she's reading to her daughters from this book about it, pretty much the most functional family possible, like with the most like preternaturally um, obedient children. And the contrast is just so interesting. I wanted to hear more about why you chose that. Well, 
The Long Winter by Laura Ingalls Wilder is a masterpiece. And if you have not read it, you should read it, even if you are not interested in reading the entire series. The family almost starves to death. The whole town almost starves to death. It is an amazing book. And I think I chose it because uh, the Little House on the Prairie books, um, to me, are just emblematic of girlhood. <laughs> I mean, I had a very white, upper-middle-class girlhood, and everybody I knew read those books, and every mother I knew had read those books, and every grandmother I knew, I think, had read those books. And so it just it seemed like a no-brainer. But when I thought about it a little m more deeply, because I wanted to, you know, I only had a little bit of room, and I wanted to quote a passage. Um, uh, the long winter just made so much sense to me because I feel like Corin in this whole story is struggling to provide for her kids imperfectly, may I add. Mm. But it is a struggle, and she does feel the obligation to provide for them. And uh, I have not ever had quite that struggle to provide for my kid, but anybody who looks after people feels from time to time <laughs> that they can't quite do it right and they can't measure up and they're not providing enough. Mm. And so the, the story of the long winter where the parents are watching their children starve the whole town, you know, like thinking about like what that must have felt like, um, uh, it just seemed right for Corin at that time. But yeah, on the lighter side, I think they were just going through the series together, you know? Right. Like, I don't think she just picked that because, but that was sort of like the deeper level that mm. I saw. And That's just to clarify, uh, the quote has to do with pancakes. I didn't, yeah. I didn't make that clear. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Un and unfortunately, this is where we have to end our conversation. I feel like we could go for another two hours. Um, <laughs> but everyone, uh, Megan Kelso. So I'm going to be signing at the Fanographics table like right now if, <laughs> if anybody is interested. It's a I'll beautiful be work, uh, an amazing book, uh, well worth your dollar and time. Please stop on by the Fanographics table to pick up a copy. And um, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you.